Joining us today, we have two of the Valley's most respected inno innovators, investors, and venture capitalists. In 2013, they joined forces to create Pageman Mar, and together invested in over 30 startups, including DoorDash, Garden Health, Brand Metrics, and Gusto. Recently, they announced their second round of funding of $75 million and rebranded to Pair. If you uh, look on their website under who we are, you'll see the quote, we are immigrants, having come to America penniless, but with big ideas. We've been entrepreneurs determined to build great companies. We know that success emerges only for those who have endured setbacks and overcome hurdles. We learn from our failures and we know what it takes to succeed. There are no shortcuts when it comes to building something extraordinary. All of this finds expression in our work. Okay, so um, two individual introductions here. Mar Hershenson brings extensive technical and operational experience to the partnership. Originally from Barcelona, Spain, she came to the US and got her PhD in electrical engineering from Stanford and developed a groundbreaking technique for optimizing the design of analog semiconductors. Um, oh, for her work, uh, the MIT Technology Review named her one of the top 100 young innovators. She went on to co-found three startups on mobile, e-commerce, enterprise software, and semiconductor industries. Or in, While still being a professor at Stanford, she's been recognized for her achievements as one of, Fast Company champions, of the Fast Company Champions of Innovation. The EE Times top women in microelectronics as one of the few recipients of the Marie Pistilli, I hope I said that right, Achievement Award for Electronic Design Innovation. Pageman Nozad is the duo's connector and networker. He came to US from Persia via Germany, partially due to his love of soccer. Once in the US, he convinced Mr. Amidi, owner of the Valley's most venerable oriental rug store, the Medallion Rug Company, to hire him as a sales, in a sales position. Pageman parlayed um, the contacts into selling rugs uh, to Valley Notables into um, hosted gatherings at the same rug store for top VCs and entrepreneurs. Together with Mr. Amidi, the rug store owner, they created their first investment firm called Amizad, a blending of the two family names. Pageman went on to become one of the first investors in companies like Danger, make your smartphone sidekick, Dropbox, Lending Kick, you might have heard of Dropbox, uh, Sound SoundHound. Um, today, these companies are worth $20 billion. He has been named by Forbes as one of the most successful angel investors and also awarded the Ellis Island Medal of Honor, recognizing individuals who have made it their mission to share with those less fortunate their wealth, knowledge, and indomitable courage, boundless compassion, and unique talents and self-generosity, all while maintaining the traditions of ethnic heritage as they uphold the ideals of the Amer of spirit of America. Please join me in welcoming Mar. Mara Hershenson and Pageman Nozad to our Distinguished Innovator Lecture Series. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Professor Suthi, very much. I think I'm loud enough. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much for being here. Um, thank you, Professor Suthi. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, Every time Mara and I, we come here, we tell ourselves this place is so special. So I hope you appreciate where you are. It's very rare. I've, seen, I've gone around the world in UC Berkeley. It's just truly a special place. Uh, before we start, um, I just want to thank, obviously, UC Berkeley and uh, Satruja Center of Entrepreneurship, Jill Malko, and in particular, Professor Situ. I really appreciate it inviting us here. It's an honor to be here. I, I think- to Make sure you know you're the star here. No, no. Okay. <laughs> no, I, I, think, I, I think Professor Suthi is re really doing a groundbreaking things for entrepreneurship, not only for Berkeley, for entire ecosystem. So we really appreciate it. Um, I think he mentioned on our website, it says we are immigrants penniless. So I just want to share a personal story before we start. Um, I came here in 1992 with no plans. I didn't have money. Um, I didn't speak a word English, and I was in love with a girl in Iran. So I had to get a job. 
maybe that doesn't require speaking English. Can, can you guess what was my first job here in America? Any guess? Well, taxi, you have to speak English. No, I, was, I, was a, I got a job in a car wash in San Jose. My friend gave it to me. I bought a car for $750, five payments of $150. I couldn't <laughs> pay the last one because car broke. And you know, coming from Iran, we love food. And I promised myself the first time, if I save enough money, I come uh, somewhere to ask Persian food. And I heard you see uh, around Berkeley, there is a Persian restaurant. So my first Persian food was here in Berkeley. So I always remember when I come here. Um, so we thought to maybe give you a little bit background of who we are, Pear, and, and Mar has an, an amazing presentation, how you start a company when you're a student. So if you don't mind, we'll start here. Um, so a little bit about our names. As, as Professor Situ, we started to be Pejman Mar. Um, so it was our first name, Mar said Pejman, everybody knows you, so let's start with our first name. But we always wanted to change the name because we wanted to build the best seed fund ever existed. And we want to hire people to come part of our team. So it didn't make sense to have our name at the door. And we wanted to have a, f a name of the fruit because we think entrepreneurship, entrepreneurs, ideas, a lot of fruit. You need water, you need soil, you need farmers. And, and Pear was just perfect name. And you can still find us there, Pejman and Mar. But I think uh, we, we really love the name and logo. So we started with Pear. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about ourselves. You know, I started to be an angel investor. In 2000, fast forward, I invested over 150 startups. And um, you know, I'll let Mar talk about her background. But I think this is kind of a yin and yang team. So there's no, that's why we are a perfect team, because we're coming completely to different background. Um, you know, Mar, I met her 16 years ago when I funded Andy Rubin. He started Danger. And after that, he went and, and started Android. And we became a really good friends. Uh, in 2003, I was very fortunate to back her second company. And then in 2012, I said, don't start your fourth company. Come and join me to start Page Mar Mars. So I will let Mar talk about her background before we start to talk about Pear and how we add value to the whole ecosystem of entrepreneurship. Actually, I think they told us to tell a story. So I'm going to tell the story of Pejman that is really interesting. My husband uh, started a company with Andy Rubin. This is before the iPhone. It was called Danger. And it was the first really smartphone. You it would open up like this. You may have seen it in movies. It was called a Psychic. And in 1999, it was here in the Valley. Everybody was funding everything that ended in dot com, but not phones. Nobody saw that thought that phones were actually going to be something for the future. So for nine months, you know, there were three founders. They hired people. We were living in our credit cards. I think they visited everybody in Sand Hill Road, every possible person. And I thought, you know, we didn't own a house at that time, but I thought they're going to take whatever we have because we're so much in debt with this company. And then my husband came, and he said, we found this guy that gave us money. And I said, oh my God, who gave you money? He's like, oh, this guy in the rug store, you know? <laughs> and I said, it's crime money. You can't take it, you know? So that's how. Uh, but that tells the story of Peshman. I think he is, uh, you know, that's why I decided to go and do this fund with him. And I think the rest of my professional career will be here. Uh, he's a, he doesn't uh, mind saying yes when the rest are saying no. So I think, um, and you know, it was a good bet to bet on mobile phones in 1999, right? Um, but you know, that's how I met Peshman. Anyways. Cool. Um, so we are early stage venture capital firm, as Professor Situ said. In 2013, we raised $50 million. And then in 2000, just this year, summer, we closed a $75 million. Uh, fun. We actually do a ground zero work. Most of the people who are doing this are shying away because it's very, very difficult to build companies from ground zero. This is how venture capital industry started 40, 50 years ago. Today, most of the venture capitalists are shying away from ground zero work, and that's where Mara and I saw a huge opportunity to build an institution. We'll tell you more about it. Um, I think um, at the center of, of Pear, uh, it's our community. So we are building a very dynamic community, and we'll tell you a little bit more about it. But we, we help entrepreneurs in a variety of different aspects of, of their businesses. Um, 
So we do speaker series. Every month we have speakers who come and talk about particular uh, topics. They are venture capitalist CEOs. Sometimes we invite people from non-tech background to tell their stories, what are the problems, their challenge just they have. And we invite our founders and a lot of students. And our office actually is in downtown Palo Alto, just walking distance from Stanford campus. Uh, we, we do founder education, so we do a lot of workshops. And workshops is um, typically half a day, and we invite an expert to do a workshop around a particular topic. And uh, some of them are not really um, technical workshops. So last one was with chief speechwriter uh, for former chief speechwriter for White House. And he really helped our founders uh, thinking through how you create a powerful message. Um, the other one is we do hackathon. Uh, hackathon is, you know, we invite people like you, developers, to come and hack around particular topics. In fact, September 24th and 25th, we are doing a hackathon with the biggest fashion photographer in the world, Mario Testino. So if you're interested, please, please join us Saturday and Sunday, September 24th and 25th. And we do a lot of social events. We, Mara and I, we really believe that when we bring people together, they can share a lot of stories, they talk to each other, they make friends. So it's really an integral part of our, our community. Um, and then we do CEO dinners. We, every quarter, we invite six to eight of our CEOs around intimate dinner and to talk about their background, their families, and their challenges. So we bring the, the CEOs really together and, and at the end, this is our space in downtown. It's just really funky space. It used to be a home, and we turned it to an office over there. Um, um, I think, as Mar mentioned, we are not afraid to write the first check. And historically, we were seed investor, the first check in all of these companies. And we are really proud to be partnered with like, really exceptional founders. Um, I know DoorDash founders um, came, came to Cal, and he's just so proud of, of being a Cal alum. Um, we have three kind of programs we created for students. Uh, one is, is actually we started the, the Stanford Garage. Every year we select 15 to 20 students from Stanford. These are from freshmen all the way to postdoctorate. They don't need to have any ideas, but they, they, have to, they wanted to be entrepreneurs. So we invite them to become part of our ecosystem. We give them space, we give them mentorship, we help them explore problems they want to solve. Hopefully, at the end of nine months, they start to build the company. And we don't take any equity, kind of you know, zero string attached. For that, I think we are kind of under skin of Stanford. We know what's going on over there. And that led us to summer launch pad. So we felt some of students throughout the last year of study, they start to build companies. And we create this 10 weeks launch pad uh, that is specifically helping founders start their company. So last two years was only. Um, dedicated to Stanford students. This year, we opened it up. We have one team with Berkeley. I was talking to Professor Situ. We'd love to have like, at least half of the team from Berkeley. So we're going to reach out to you. Come and talk to Mar and I if you're interested. This is an exceptional program. We have 13 teams. All of them are getting funded. And they're really, really groundbreaking companies. And the, 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 the third one is like Cal Berkeley Challenge. We started last year. So we invest in one company out of Berkeley. So the criteria is one of the founders should be enrolled at uh, Berkeley last three years, and we invest $250,000 in the company. We give 10% of ownership back to Berkeley. So I think we'd love to see you if you're working on anything. And actually, uh, as a philosophy, we believe entrepreneurs create future, not investors. So we don't focus any particular area. We just really love to back you know, very um, people who are solving real problem in the big market. Um, you know, these are the companies came out of our dorm. A few of them went to raise a lot of money, and actually, they were at the time that we invested, all of the founders were students. Um, and now I pass it to Mar. I think this is a very special presentation he has for all of you. Okay. Awesome. So I, you know, I thought we'd put a presentation together. I've done a version of this before, and it's. Um, about what, you know, how do you start a company when you have nothing, when there is, you know, you don't have a product, you may not even have an idea, but you know deep in your heart you really want to start a company, right? So um, I think maybe some of you are in this situation, you're a student, and you just know you want to start a company. This is why you're taking this class, right? Okay, so this is uh, the first step. You should try to research and learn, and especially you know, if I could go back to school, that's all I would do is try to figure out what problems, what cool things people are working on. So don't be in a rush to getting out. There's so much information here. We have 
like Pejman was saying, incredible success with Stanford uh, and CMU, Berkeley companies that have come out and the students uh, were just, you know, the founders were students. So that's my advice. Um, you should find problems, real problems, more than solutions, real problems. Because once you find a problem, it's almost easy to find a solution. It's like, you know, I, some of you are getting a PhD. The hardest part to find a PhD is to figure out what you're going to work on. And then once you figure it out, you're out in a year. So uh, that's that. And the other thing is you should find people. Because let's assume magically you come up with this amazing uh, idea. The next thing you have to do is look around and find somebody to do it with you. And you're here on campus. And somebody told me once, uh, when I was a grad student, I'm like, I can't wait to graduate. I don't have any money. Um, and somebody told me, well, no matter, you know, you, you ask a question here in the lab, you're surrounded by really smart people, but you go outside an industry, and it's really hard to get the same level. So I cannot emphasize that point enough. Anyway, so that's point zero. Uh, OK, point one, um, it's, uh, I would say, bootstrap. There is a high correlation on companies that are actually already successful before they raise their first money. So if you are mildly successful before you raise your first dollar, there is a high chance this company will be big or it will be successful. It will have an exit where the founder um, you know, makes some money. OK, so how do you bootstrap? You get something done, and you use your imagination. Um, without you know, coming to Peshman or I, okay, or equivalent, all right? And many people have done this. I have a few examples. This one is uh, you know, uh, Yahoo. Yahoo was a very successful company at some point. It was, um, you know, <laughs> it, things change. Um, by the time, you know, they, this guy started in the lab. By, you know, they were, they put this website together. It was a list, it was a list of, directory of websites. Um, by December of 94, they had already a million hits. At the time, a million hits was incredible because there were no people on the internet, right? So it was an incredible success. It was the number one website. Uh, and they didn't raise any money until April of 95. So these guys were in their lab taking advantage of you know, the free resources that Stanford provided them. So that's, you know, again, you guys are here at Berkeley. That's something you could do. Um, this is another example. I was a student. I was a grad student when Google was in beta, and it, was, it had a .stanford.edu uh, website. And again, we were using it on campus for everything. Um, they registered the domain in 90, the actual domain in 97, but they didn't get any money until almost a year and a half later. So that gives you a sense that you don't need to wait for investors to really do something that proves that you have a company. OK? Um, and this is a, another one. Again, Airbnb. These guys were really hungry. They were able to get people in houses before they raised a single dollar. So again, there is all these examples. And um, you know, there is definitely a strong, I, I don't have the data, the actual quantitative data, but there's a strong correlation of like, if you raise a large amount of money before you do anything, likelihood of failure. So think about that. OK, the second thing, let's assume you've bootstrapped, you have something, you know something people are going to pay you money for, right? Um, OK, you have, and then you're like, I really want to grow faster, or I know if I do this, I'll be able to sell more in a year, so I should raise some money. The first question you really need to ask yourself, and this is super important, is what type of company you want to build, right? And you know, I think we're here in the Valley, and you hear venture, and people associate success with raising money. But it has nothing to do with raising money, OK? Very few people should actually raise money. So these are the questions you should ask yourself. And they're very personal. They should be, you know, do I want a quick exit? Maybe you don't want to build a company. Maybe you have a great technology you've developed in your lab, and you just need to prove that it works. And I think there's 10 people that are going to buy it, especially if it's for self-driving cars. I think everybody wants to buy something today. So that's one thing. You, you may want to have a lifestyle business. One of my PhD, um, you know, my group, my research group, he's had this business for now 20 years, designing analog circuits. 
I can't tell you how much money he makes, but he makes an incredible amount of money. He's never raised venture as a services business, and he's perfectly happy, and he gives employment to a bunch of people. So it's a definitely a very successful life to do that. Um, you want to know, do I want to grow fast, or do I want to grow safe? And again, that goes with your character. When you raise money, you are expected to grow, you know, and you want to go 10x in a year. 10x in a year is a big number, believe it or not. So if you don't want to do that, if you're like, hey, I just, you know, don't want to run out of money, I don't want to be in this, then you're grow safe. You'd need a different type of investor, okay? All right, let's assume you have this conversation with you, yourself. Um, the next thing is you have to understand where, you are, where you're at, okay? There is a lot of terminology out there whether I'm a pre-seed, a seed, an A, a this or that, right? And people are a little confused about where they are when they come and talk to us to raise money. Okay, so we have some definitions. These are the pair definitions. We have like three buckets that we invest, and I think when you're at T0, we call you a pre-seed company. So a pre-seed company is a, you know, it could be one, two, three founders, or four founders, some founders, right? They may have, a prototype, they may have a customer, but they may not have a prototype, they may not have a customer, and they may have some IP, they may have something that we think is worth investing in, we call it pre-seed. Um, and in that case, the company raises anywhere from zero to 500K. That's what we call a pre-seed, okay? Now you could be in a seed stage, and the seed stage could be something like I showed earlier, like you know Google or Yahoo, this guy, you you, you have a, you built something, it might not be the final product, but you have already very happy users. And that's called a seed, and people will raise anywhere from 500, I should put that two and a half million. Or, you know, you could be in series A where you're already having customers grow, you know, many customers, repeated sales, et cetera, and you just need more cash to grow. So depending on where you are, you'll go to some different person. Okay. Okay, this is a... Another thing, you have to have some sort of realistic ask. Uh, and this is uh, what people think when they go ask a valuation. You ask your friend that raised money a year ago or six months ago, how much money, how much, what was a valuation or whatever. Or you read it, TechCrunch, that something like this happened. The founders always look at one side and the investors always look at the one side. And we always meet, meet in the middle, right? But I think you are possibly you can err on both sides of the curve. If you go and ask for an incredible valuation because somebody did something or you heard something, um, you know, you may turn some people off. So this is important to be calibrated. Don't just base it on one data point. That's important. Okay. Once you figure out where you are and how much you want to raise at what, then you have to figure out who to ask. Okay. So this is very simple, but, um, you know, in a pre-seed, and you probably know all of this, but there's friends and family, there's angels, there's pre-seed funds, we do pre-seed, there's early accelerators, and in the seed there's some angels, some seed funds, uh, seed funds, some series A's, and growth accelerators. And A, you know, you have the A plus funds. So one mistake that people do is they are pre-seed and they go raise from series A people, right? And we see that all the time. Um, and of course, sitting here now, you'd be like, no, it doesn't make any sense. But when you're in the rush of raising money, you don't even care who you're talking to. You just want to go raise some money. But it hurts you at the end, because there is something about meeting somebody for the first time, right? And um, when you meet somebody for the first time, there's that element of surprise and excitement. And you want that in your first investment meeting. So if you want somebody to raise your Series A, just wait until you're ready. And you're just have a higher likelihood of getting that person, okay? All right. Okay, this is very important. Uh, when you go raise money, you pick your person, what do you have to do? Uh, this takes time, you have to articulate a vision. I have Facebook here, and people know Facebook, but <laughs> this vision is not I am a social network. They wanna give people the power to share and make the world more open and connected, right? So it's a big vision, and this means that you know, they're launching satellites or they will launch another satellite into space because they want to connect people, right? Uh, and that's what investors want to see if you're doing venture, people that have this big vision. This is one of our companies, Mimi Box, and uh, you know, you can, def you can come to an investor and say, hey, we're an e -com beauty e-commerce company, right? And most of us will be like, ugh, I don't know if I wanna do e-commerce, I don't know if I wanna do beauty, I don't know, right? But you can have a founder saying, 
hey, we're really changing the way people consume beauty products, you know, and it almost changes the way somebody's going to perceive you. So you have to sit down if you're doing it, I don't, whatever. I can, we can play this game later if you want to. You can tell me what you're doing, and I can tell you what your big vision should be, right? Doesn't mean you're doing it today. It means you want to go there someday, okay? This is another one of our companies. And this is what they do. They use machine learning to predict optimal disaster response, right? And again, that's exactly what they do. But that should not be their vision. Their vision, you know, it's you know, to change the way people manage um, disaster response. And again, for anything. OK, the next thing is you have to tell a good story. So when you go fundraise, it's not about numbers. It's a sales exercise. So I don't know how many people have done sales in the audience. But sales is a little bit, you know, you're acting, you are emphasizing certain words, and you have to prepare for it very much so, right? The only way, um, you know, to tell a good story is, you know, to do all of these things that I've put in the screen, and we can talk more about it lately, la later, but there is a lot of work that goes into it. This is the most important. You have to practice, 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 right? If you want to, say, raise money from Peshman, you know, uh, it, he's your target, right? You really want Peshman as your investor. Peshman should not be the first person you give your pitch, okay? Because, uh, but that's, that I assure you that at least 60% of the people, that's what they do. They're like, I want money from Peshman, I'm just gonna go tell him. I'm like, no, you have to go see the people you don't want money from, get some feedback, get some practice, practice with your friends, and then you go see Peshman, right? And I think you have a higher chance of success if you do that, okay? All right, this is the next thing. You have to have a plan when you go raise money. It's not like, hey, I have a vision, I have an idea, I have a customer, so I want some money, you know? Okay, that makes us really nervous because we really want people that come in and be like, I have all of this and I know exactly what I'm gonna do to get to my next step, okay? It's very important. So this is what you should not say. I just heard that yesterday from two PhDs. So I'm raising one and a half million dollars for five people to last 18 months. I'm like, okay, but well, what are you gonna do with the money, right? So you have to say something like, and you, this, you, you should go into more details. I'm happy to send you this little template we have. I'm raising one and a half million, I'm hiring people, we're gonna do this, we're gonna sell this much, and I'm gonna be ready to raise my Series A at this point, right? And the biggest mistake people do when they raise money is not do this exercise because you all very optimistic, I got some money, but then very quickly the money disappears and then you have to be ready to raise more money and you better have achieved the goals that you set up. Okay, all right. The last thing, no, not the last, but almost the last. You have to show you can get things done. Okay, so when we, when somebody comes and talks to us, and I assume any investors, we're not just evaluating the idea or the pitch or everything that you're telling us, but also we're trying to figure out your journey to get to that place, right? So, um, you know, this is something that may apply to you guys. Oh, I don't have an engineer in my team, so I don't have a product. I'm sorry, that's why I'm raising money, right? Now, some people, would say, I'm not a, I don't have any engineers, but I was able to prototype my product. And how do you do that, right? Well, you know, we've had founders that, you know, prototype the product using UX prototyping tools, and you, they almost feel when you come to do the pitch that you actually have a product ready to go, right? They have, we've had non-technical founders who will go into a boot camp and learn some coding just so they can actually get it off the ground, right? And any of you, don't be afraid of coding. It's actually fairly simple. You can do it if you're not technical. Um, the other thing, and I think this is very important, you have to be a generous founder, right? If you're not technical and you need money to hire an engineer, we think about maybe they don't have the right mentality. Your menta we prefer people that say, I'm gonna give a big percentage of my company to somebody that's gonna be my partner in building this company and they'll be the technical person, right? So this is our, our view on it. All right, this is another scenario. People come and they'll have consumer business. I have a few scenarios, but again, we can role play. I don't have a product, so I can't test what's gonna be my customer acquisition cost. I just can't test it, sorry. So you'll have to give me money because if you give me money, I'll be able to prove to you that I can do a very, you know, I can, you know, have a low acquisition cost. And we're sitting there thinking, I don't know, is it 
is it low or not? Is it high? So what can you do? This is what some founders have done. You know, they built landing pages, right? Several landing pages. They spend like whatever, $25 for a few days on Facebook, and they try to figure out how people are converting into the different landing pages. So they have at least an estimate. This is a very simple exercise, doesn't take very long. You don't have to, you just say, hey, this many people clicked and this many people give me my email. So I think if I have a product, I'll be able to sell it, you know? And that's a great test for you guys. Um, you can write content, so SEO is a great way to test if people are even interested in what you're saying. Um, so no excuse if you don't have a product, you can at least do some testing. All right. Uh, the other thing is you're selling enterprise, you're not really getting people off the internet to buy your product. And you say, I don't have customers because I don't have a product, so how can I prove to you that I can have a customer, right? Uh, give me money so I can prove to you I have a customer. So again, um, we have some amazing founders. I think LinkedIn, if you have an enterprise company, is an incredible resource, which have become experts at reaching customers on LinkedIn. They even A-B test the different messages. Um, you know, I think if you guys are sending a message, you should make sure you say I'm a student at Berkeley and you can target people that are Berkeley alums. You have a higher likelihood of them opening your email, but you can target CFOs, CTOs, whatever at Fortune 500 companies. And we've seen, even with no product, with no team, people will respond to emails. And you can go and talk to them and say, hey, I'm building this, what do you think? And typically people want to talk to you and they tell you what they want. So um, definitely works. We have, we've had some people come in that have surveys. Again, you can do, in this day and age, you can target anybody on the internet. You can use Sur SurveyMonkey audience or any other, whatever, survey software to do that. You can go interview people and get testimonials, but there's ways to convince some of us that you actually can get stuff done before you have some money, okay? All right, uh, number 10 is like show off your character. So I think when there is nothing, when there is nothing at all, Probably one of the most important things is character, and I think Peshman is a master of reading characters. But um, you know, it's an interesting situation because a founder is like, I call it a dichotomy of a founder. They're like dual personalities, you know? And except for communication, you have to be paranoid and you have to be an optimist. You have to be focused, but you have to be ambitious. And you have to be resilient, but you, I mean, everything is like, it has this, you know, opposite. So you have to find the middle ground and we're looking for somebody that is, has this balance and it's a really hard act to pull through. So anyways, and then this is probably the most important I would say, choose your team wisely. And I think everybody here has heard that you have to recruit wisely, right? And you should spend time recruiting an A plus team, but you have to recruit an A-plus investor for your team. It's as important as your first hire, right? Because you want somebody to partner with you and to help you when something doesn't go right or to you know, be there in significant amount of time to, you know, to help you with whatever you don't know or cheer you up when you're feeling down. Because in a startup, that's what happens. There's not, never a straight line. So um, some people say, oh, I, I'm I really want to finish fundraising quickly because I want to get back to work. I'm like, what's more important than fundraising? You're like, have to build your company. So you shouldn't like take the first money you get. Just make sure you know the person you're working with and it's super important. Okay, uh, so I think that's kind of my little advice or um, about how to go from zero to something. I think we're gonna do some Q&A. I have uh, one last slide. And I think this is important, you know, Peshman and I, and I recommend you guys do this once you start a company. When we sat down to start our fund, we really wanted to figure out what is our core values? Like, what do we believe in? What do we want to do? What do we want to do in 20 years, right? Um, the same way you guys should have a big vision, we wanted to have our own vision. So for us, you know, these are the way we live, you know, founders first. It's very important to us. I think you guys, there's nothing as stressful as being a CEO. Nothing compares to it. There's just no, and whoever in this room has gone through it, they know what I'm talking about. Um, we, partnership is really important for us. Ambition and conviction, that's, you know, again, that dichotomy. Uh, humility, I think, you know, we're learning every day. We are like privileged to be surrounded by founders that are putting their lives every day to, in their startups. And um, finally, 
trust. So these are our values, and I just wanted to leave you guys with that. Anyways, that's it. Can we go there? First of all, thank you guys. That was um, that was a great introduction. Yeah. yeah, I'm gonna take this one. Does that work? All right, all right. Great intro. Thanks for kind of opening up, explaining the fund, explaining what you're doing, kind of how you think. You know, just all all of that. Uh, I got what I, you guys. What I've got here is. Um, two sets of questions, some questions I made up on my own, and I've got some of your questions. Why don't we, we'll do a bit of a combination, and then, you know, possibly you might think of something new along the way. Um, let, let me get, like, a little bit into it, but if you, you know, if you, if you really got a question, like, in the middle, no problem, we, we can entertain that one, too. All right, so, um, here, l let me start off with this one. Um, Tell me about that link between, you know, on your website, there's a, um, there's a connection between immigrants and entrepreneurs. Um, I mean, you're, you're, you're very clear about it. I mean, communicating right on your website. Obviously, you've both lived this thing. Uh, tell us about this connection. You know, is it, a, is it significant? Are, all, are most entrepreneurs also immigrants? What's your view of the link between these? You know, I think, um, you know, when you come as an immigrant to, to a country, you face new challenges, language, uh, food, culture. So you have to adapt pretty quickly. Um, so when we look at founders, we love founders who can adapt to their environment pretty quickly with all the stress, team building. So I think we, we look at those certain quality of the founders. And I think, you know, we have worked with a lot of immigrants and, you know, they have shown um, through experiences that they have an edge over other entrepreneurs. But we fund everybody. But I think personally, <laughs> yeah. per personally, I think we yeah. have had this experience and we, we follow kind of certain traits among founders that Mar mentioned few of it. Yeah, so if I translate that, you're basically saying that people who are immigrants are in this learning everything phase and you think that's what, the fact that you're in that mode of thinking, actually that learning all the time is what makes you a great entrepreneur. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Definitely helps. Definitely De helps. <laughs> Better but, than the alternative. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're looking for people. At the end of the day, this entrepreneurship is uh, survival, right? And there's many times where you want to throw down the towel. And you know, it's not like Peshman was able to go back to Iran because he didn't get any Persian food for a month, right? right. So when you're a founder, it's the same thing. Many times you're there and you're like, oh my God, I just, I cannot deal with this. I have to go, but you can't because you're committed, you know? A little bit, you have to be hungry for these things, yes. right? Um, and totally. Uh, it, you know, it, if you're happy in every way and you don't need anything. It's harder. I, I think what you're saying, it makes it harder. You know, harder to, yes. uh, to do the things that need to be done. Yeah, it's almost like you want people that have to, something to prove. You know? Yeah, right. And, and I think for that, you have to go back to what motivates everybody. Yes. Right? Some people have stuff, but it's not enough for them. That's right. So, but you just need a source of motivation, and mm -hmm. apparently hunger is one of them. Hunger. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and actually the fact that you know being an entrepreneur, the whole journey is kind of a roller coaster emotionally. Yeah. So we look for founders who are not easily rattled. So. Ah. Okay. All right. Um, let me ask. Let me kind of take you guys one at a time. Just a background on career in a little way. Mar, you have a very interesting career path. I'll say that. Um, you know, a professor, an entrepreneur, an investor, um, you know, definitely started out deep tech. Um, what is that transition, that journey, that path like for you? Mm -hmm. How did you decide that, okay, I don't want to be this category anymore, and now I want to switch yeah. to this other one? Well, I think my character, you know, it's interesting, but, um, you know, I get bored pretty easily. Things are kind of flat and don't change. So I actually think venture is really my perfect job because I get to see every day new ideas. I can go really deep and learn something and move to the next thing. So it's actually, for my character, it's a good job. And I think everybody has different mentality. So if you, you know, I did my first career was in the semiconductor industry. There's very few women in semiconductor. 
believe it or not. So I was widely recognized, and you know, it would have yep. been a great job to stay forever. And I looked at myself, and I'm like, wow, I'm not even 40. I have a lifetime recognition. What am I going to do for the rest of my life? So um, <laughs> you know, I decided I just got to do something else. That's not enough for me. And you know, I think uh, I don't regret it. I think what I do right now is very close to being a professor. I think a lot of the people we work with, we, are, we teach them for a little bit, then they take off. So it's similar to being a professor and having grad students. Um, so it's very rewarding in that sense. I, so I, being an investor yeah. is like teaching. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yes, you have to raise money for your yeah, projects, yeah, yeah. you have to pick the right grad students, right? and then you have to give them enough direction where you can't do their job, otherwise they can't graduate, right? Yeah, you're, you're taking uh, teaching to a new level here. Yes. Yeah. Uh, all right, let, let me uh, switch gears. So my question for you, um, you made some amazing investments here. OK, uh, Dropbox, I mean, that's a big deal. Lending Club, I mean, you got this list of things, and they're a big deal. I want to know. How do you find them? How did they find you? Like, there's some networking that's going on here, and you seem to be like really great at it. How does this work? You know, it's kind of pattern recognition. I was actually very, very lucky when I started to be an angel investor, late 99, 2000. You have to imagine there was no tech crunch, angel list, none of this. And you know, the first nine months when I started to make investment, I think my track record is perhaps the worst in the history. I made so many bad mistakes, but I was very lucky to meet Andy Rubin. Um, so normally in any career, it takes like 10 to 20 years to meet somebody like Andy. And you know, Mar's husband was the co-founder with Andy. That's how I got to know Mar. But seeing Andy and the team in action, it just gave me a great perspective that what type of founders I want to work with. So that was pure luck to just get to know Andy. That's but like after, you benchmark. correct. You, you got a benchmark by meeting like one really good person. Yes. And that helped you set how to correct. meet other people. Yes, and but fast forward, I think us as a fund, uh, I think we look for founders who are really close to the problem they're solving. I think they're very passionate, there's a history. Normally, if founders have 20 ideas and narrow it down to five and pick one, it's kind of the red flag for us. Um, I, I think when I met um, Drew and Arash at Y Combinator Demo Day, and at that time, it was only eight teams presenting. Today is like 150 and then a few, a thousand people in the audience. It was only 30 people. I just felt that they're building something really extraordinary. And you know, I spend a lot of time over Persian tea. That's our secret sauce here. So when we want to do it, we invite them to Persian tea to get to know them. Is there anything in the tea? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I can't talk about that. Okay. So. <laughs> but, I, I, but I think it just gives us a great opportunity to get to know people, because building product is one thing, but building company is completely different. And I learned throughout the years, many people can build product. Only few can build big companies. So I think Duran Arash just definitely uh, in that category of founders. So you know, I'm thinking that um, today, probably all kinds of people are coming out of the woodworks and would like to talk to you. Yes. But if you go back to when you first started, how did you get to those places where these people were? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, it, it's easier for you today, I'm sure, to network. But starting out, it's, you know, I mean, think about where they are, where maybe where we all are. <laughs> and, um, you know, and how do, you know, how do sure. we collectively? Yeah, maybe I give you a little bit of background. As you know, I started as, as Professor Sithu said, I started to sell Persian rugs to go to this business. So I don't know, you have been downtown Palo Alto. I started in the rug gallery and became really good at it. And when you sell high end Persian carpets, you don't sell it at the store, you go to people's home. Uh, and you spend like a few hours with their family. Sometimes you sit down and have dinner with them. Um, so fast forward after a few years, I felt the community around me who are buying these carpets are venture capitalists, CEO, founders, professors. And you know, it was kind of jaw dropping for me that how much value you're creating in the world. And I just wanted to be part of it. I said, this is the community I want to be part of it. And I started to educate myself. I started to read a lot of books. I just went to the conferences. and. You know, what I did first, because I didn't come from a tech background, I started, I started to put a lot of social events together at the rug gallery. So I invited venture capitalists, and then a lot of founders. And again, going back to 2000, there were not too many of these gatherings at that time. 
And then venture capitalists got to notice my deal flow is really strong. So I started to do a lot of networking and networking events for people to get to know me, but by adding value to the whole ecosystem. I was just helping founders by connecting to the other advisors and investors. And I think when you do good things, things come back to you, and that's one of the philosophy Mara and I have. Do good to people and great things will happen. That's nice. Well, that's really nice. Um, all right, so, and, and I'm gonna just reframe your answer for just double checking that even I got it. Um, so basically, one, you know, the social events and the people are just really part of it and the relationships there. But there was a second part, which is you learned whatever you needed to learn. I mean, you could have just stopped there. You could have just ha held an event. But instead, you're spending your time figuring out what things are relevant to this set of people. Yes, I just paid a lot of attention. Who are the players? What is a venture capital? Is How do they work? And, and actually, you know, going back to what I said as a principle at our firm, just do good things. Today, some of our best deal flows comes from the founders who we didn't invest because we just want to help and they, they notice that we are in this for the long journey. Mm. All right, um, my last of the, my questions before I turn to, your, uh, to the student questions. And um, this, is, uh, this is a little bit of just a, two years ago, I had never heard of Page and Moore, okay? <laughs> <laughs> right? And then we see a, um, I don't know if it was in, San Ho in the San Francisco paper or you know where, but we, we saw this $250,000 prize only for a Berkeley team. I'm like, who are these guys? <laughs> I've, never, I've never heard of them. And uh, you know, sooner or later, I, I ran into, actually met you at, at, the, at your uh, Office. uh, offices, yeah. Uh, by the way, you guys should see their offices. It's nothing like what you think. Um, <laughs> just leave that. <laughs> Wait till they show up. There's tea. <laughs> <laughs> there is tea, yeah. Um, uh, but so uh, what motivated you to um, do this prize at Berkeley, for Berkeley? I mean, you really made a commitment to do something at Berkeley sure. and, and to get to know yeah. Berkeley. You know, we think it's pretty simple and obvious, right? Because there's amazing people here at Berkeley. I think every time I come here, I just want to stay here longer. So um, it was... We have that effect on people. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we know, Peshman and I thought, how can we you know, work with these people? So we thought doing this challenge was a way of investing long-term into Berkeley. And that's why we decided to do it. We just wanted to work with more Berkeley people. Basically. You realize that question was a complete setup. I just wanted you to say that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right, all right. Yeah. So um, maybe, do you guys have a question right now? Or I can go to the, uh, uh, the ones that you already sent in. Does anybody have a question? Yeah. How do you manage your time? Entrepreneurship sounds hectic. You know, I personally, <laughs> um, <laughs> I never had this notion that you go to work and then work stops and you go home with your family and then it's always 24 hours. I'm not saying I'm working 24 hours, but I think I never separated my work life and social life. It's all part of my life. So, and we spend most of our time with entrepreneurs. But if you have like 100 people calling you, who do you respond to? I think time management is such a big challenge that we're just investing in a time management company. It tells you how you know, big <laughs> of a problem we think it is. Um, it's a big challenge. You know, I think Peshman and I are learning every day, and I think we're literally adapting ourselves. And yeah. as we are, you know, you didn't know about us, but now you do, and more people do, so we get more companies, and we're trying to figure out internal processes as to how do we, you know, are good to people. And I always, when I say no, I try to say why and what can you do to get to the next step so that, you know, it's not just no or no response, which I thought as a founder was like the worst thing, right? You send something and just don't hear back. So, um, but it's a big challenge. We don't have a good answer for you, sadly. I don't. You know, I personally actually evaluate even the first contact with entrepreneurs. I think we like founders who can navigate through the yeah. challenges. And one of them is how you navigate to get through me. The easiest way is through LinkedIn, which I have so much spam I don't read it. 
But I think if you're smart enough, you can find Professor Sith who knows me, and you can have just one word about him in the email you send me to get my attention. Or you can talk about World Cup and soccer or Manchester United, then I'll pay attention. But if, but if you come to me and say I'm raising $50 million, you haven't even read about me. So I just, just figure out even the first email how they got to know me. And, and when you talk to them in the first five minutes, what are you looking for that, um, oh, I need to keep talking to these guys? Yeah, it's a very important question. So, I don't know, I think we, we always, Mara and I start the conversation with, tell us about yourself and your background, your story. Um, it's very, very important. You know, as much as it's important what you do now, for us it's important what you have done before, how you got here. So we really want to hear why you're doing this. Um, it's very fashionable to become entrepreneurs. We love founders who uh, are passionately solving a real problem rather than chasing big ideas. I think it's a big distinction. Um, it's, I think there's nothing, wrong, like there's nothing wrong about dreaming big or chasing big ideas, but we believe Silicon Valley is run by the teams who are not chasing big ideas, but they're solving real problems. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, often teams who are taking too big of a task early on, they fail. Teams who are laser focused on doing one task early on, they end up building big companies. It, it's kind of a story of concreteness, right? Yes. I mean, you're, you're saying, like, don't tell me some giant thing. Like, if you find people who are like, this is what I'm doing, and they're really specific, and you feel like they're, they're down in those details and they know what they're doing, that's... That's like motivating you. Yes. You know, I should say that um, the answer to your question is actually really hard, and that's why we're in business, because we can't just build a quantitative model and say they check these three variables, thus we should fund it. There is yeah. a, we're working on that, by the way. I know, I'm sure you are. It's <laughs> yeah. really hard because we are fun, we're funding the outliers, right? And yeah. We are looking for this really outlier people. Sometimes Pejman will come to me and say, I like that they're not weird enough. <laughs> like, what do you mean? And, uh, you yeah. like that they're not weird enough? No, I like them, but they are not weird oh, enough. Oh, they're not weird enough. It, yes. it, they didn't pass it's the, the opposite. Didn't right? pass so how the do weird you quantify test. in a model the outliers? I think it's hard. Yeah. That, well, <laughs> and with that, another question. <laughs> Yeah, I think my biggest mistake in, in venture was and is not spending enough time to get to know the founders and even those who I not ended up investing in became really big companies was just because I purely was analyzing the business and the future and I thought, wow, Google can do this or Uber can do that versus I had to spend more time with this founder. And then same thing when companies didn't make it was I didn't get to know the founder really well, so I couldn't really read his actions. So in a way, you're investing really more in people than the idea. You know, for us, for Mar and I, just there's not much data when we look at the companies. If you do pre-seed and seed, it's basically, there's no customer. We can't even call customers because there's no customers. So it's getting to know the founders. Yeah, you know, there's a lot, I mean, I look at some of the um, companies on your on your website or you know portfolio companies, and I you know and I'll like, you know I'll look at one of those and I'll be like, I guess you know I mean like I'm like <laughs> it's like either you have like this magic crystal ball and you're like oh yeah that's gonna be big you know I mean like you can see it but it sounds like what you're saying is it's not that it's really because you know the people and I don't know the people so I can't tell from the from the company what you're actually seeing. Yeah. Exactly. And the same idea with two different people is two different companies. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah. It's so, really the people that, yeah. that make it what it's gonna be. Yeah. Yes. The seed. Yep. Uh-huh. Hi, first of all, thank you so much, Bethman and Mark, for being here today. Um, I just want to know, you were talking about patent recognition, and I want to know a bit more about what tools or strategies you use, or you think that uh, new entrepreneurship use in order to just see the market trends? Hmm. We actually have this slogan that uh, we don't follow trends. Oh, we I'm think sorry. Repeat the question for the microphone because he, it's not recorded. Yeah, his question was what kind of tools you use to see what are the trends out there. 
I think when it's a trend, we believe it's already too late to invest. We, if you look at the biggest company ever created, we're not the hottest company. So when things are hot, it's only too late. So I think you want, and you always want to predict future before anybody else. Um, you know, I, many of you, you know today, artificial intelligence is very hot. It's just everybody's using it. One venture capitalist was telling me that if you sprinkle a little bit of AI in your deck, you get funding. Um, you know, three years ago, Mara and I, we funded three, actually four AI companies doing really well today. And not because we were genius as we thought the future is AI. Once you work with the brightest mind at Berkeley, at Stanford, and CMU, these are the people who tell you this is the future. So we partner with founders who can really understand the future before anybody else. And this is one of the reasons for the Berkeley challenge. To, to get to those smart people. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, by the way, on your um, AI story, I know another investor, maybe I won't name him, but you probably know him. Um, and he says, whenever somebody comes in with a pitch deck that says, and we use AI or machine learning, he, he says, he, no. He, he, he says, really, what framework are you using? <laughs> and then he says, this is a direct quote, and then I see, wait to see if they switch into bozo mode or not. <laughs> so there's AI labeled on your deck, sure. and then there's answers like, oh, yeah, you know, we're, we're using TensorFlow, and this is, this is how, we, how we did it. But to answer your question, I think the best way is just talking to people who are expert in particular areas. I think you learn so much from them. If we just investing in the company, we can't talk about it much, but it's around protein, and we didn't know anything about it, but last, I mean, two weeks, we are just so much educated because we are talking to a PhD that it spends like last 10 years in it. And I think you will hear in like next two, three years, people talk about that. I'm looking at the uh, list from the pre-submitted questions. Um, this again, reflecting on your college journey, is there a club, class, project, um, you know, something from college that particularly gave you skills that you use even today? Yeah, you know, I was very fortunate to have, uh, you know, I would say my PhD advice, one of my PhD advisors, Professor Stephen Boyd. Um, you know, I, I want to say I survive Boyd, um, <laughs> but he was um, very meticulous and he made me learn LaTeX. Many of you probably in this yeah. room will know it. Yeah. And um, there's a package that comes with LaTeX called PS, I know it's too much detail, called PSFRAG that helps you, you know, uh, basically, um, you know, make your pictures pretty, replace some of the text. And, um, you know, I was very careless and I didn't care. I was just like writing quickly and so on. And he tortured me over and over to make sure everything was perfect to the pixel. And at the time I was like, what is wrong with this guy? Um, but I think that's been a great lesson for me. Now, you know, if you do something, do it well or don't do it, right? And I think that's uh, something I tell everything, every time to our founders. Which, so you know. it's a training that makes basically makes you not sloppy. That's right. right? That, that's what you learned. Yes. Don't, basically, don't be sloppy. I hate that my PhD lesson is LaTeX. But you know. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, there's an iPad application now. You can just draw the formula, yeah. <laughs> and it will convert it to that. There you go. <laughs> yeah. You know, I dropped college, so I can't talk much about it. But I was before I came, I played professional soccer. I was a member of Iran's national team under 17. And I think playing team sports taught me a lot. I think teamwork, respect having hope till last minute. So I think those are the things you can, it's, it's easy to underpass it, but when you pay a lot of attention, you can learn so much from your daily activities. It doesn't need to be a, a grand journey. Yeah, you know, I say one more thing. I think I get a lot of times people ask me, do you think it's worth it to do a PhD? I don't know if anybody's in this situation in the audience. It's too late for me. Too late. Yeah. Are you, are you and I would not that? take it, you know, I think it was great. I, I wish I had stayed longer, to be honest, but um, I, I would recommend it. One of, you know, I think the work ethic and you're on your own when you're a PhD student and you have to, you know, you're not in a team. So in a way, it's like you're on your own CEO, which is the same feeling you get when you're in a company, except you don't have people that depend on you. So um, I think it's actually good training to be, a, you know, our CEO. It, between the two of you, basically, your answers kind of make this complete combination of skill, right? I mean, your answer is basically, 
how to get people to work together. And your answer is um, how to be really careful on every detail. And it's like put that together, and I that's guess magic. that's, that's <laughs> the, the success. Um, we have a question. Yeah. Uh, who? Who are you seeing? OK. Thanks. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I was wondering what one of the most important values you look in people is, or just something that guides your life. And then a smaller question is, where did you get the graphics for your slides? I like them. <laughs> um, Those are impressive. The really? graphics, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I, I will tell you a secret about the slides. Half of the slides were actually done by these high school students, which are very, very talented. So anybody that um, you know, has a company and is in a low, small budget, they can come and talk to us about that. We're very cheap. Um, and the other half were done by me. So I think going back to my training at school, uh, I'm very, very uh, you know, OCD about that stuff. And I was looking at it, I'm like, oh my god, all these capped letters are wrong, and so on. So um, that's the answer to the slide. Do you want to start with the value? I, I don't think it's just one particular value. Um, um, I think at the end, being a good human being, I think it goes far. Um, to me, I think be kind to others. Yeah, I think people with high, you know, I think like be, we're looking for that captain of the ship. When you are a founder, you want to fund the captain, right? So he's the last person to leave the boat, and he's the first one up, and the last one to go to bed. And he has a plan. So I wish there was an adjective for being captain of a ship, but that's what I look, you know, that's what we look for. And internally, I think, you know, Peshman and I, it's what he said for us is do good is really important. I want to make sure that for people who want to come up and ch sure. chat with you after that there is a little time. So I think we should go down to our last two questions, right? And, and I just so, want to ask a question, how many people here are starting something? So we get to know. Oh, hey, What's the question? How many people are starting something, a company, presumably? <laughs> oh, yeah, very cool. Yeah, fantastic. That's great. A, a lot of response to that. OK, last two questions. Or maybe those are people who have a question. <laughs> um, um, actually, thank you for coming. And uh, um, because of your background, I think it's actually a very interesting combination. So I'm like, wondering about your opinion on like, getting a PhD or a master or an MBA. Or in a way, like for the company you founded, are most like founders who get like a master or like college dropout? Does that make sense? The question. Yes, we actually have a pretty diverse set of founders. I think we have several founders that are uh, from business school, several founders that are grad students, several founders that are undergrads, and some that are. Um, we have, I think, a couple that are college dropouts. Um, so we don't discriminate. You know, everything is good. I think it's, you know, it's up to you. Your, your decision has to be up to you. Like, when do I feel like, you know, I've learned enough in a way and I'm ready to go out. Um, and in general, I'm very positive on education. We don't want people to drop out. In fact, one of our best companies and has the, the dropout. He was a freshman at Stanford, the first quarter doing CS, and he came to us and he's like, yeah, I'm not learning anything. I guess you should have come here. Uh, so I'm, I'm quitting. And I'm like, oh my god, you can't quit. I'm a mother. I won't let you quit. And he said, no, my parents are totally OK with it. I said, OK. <laughs> and now you know, he's like, I think he's 20. And you know, this company, is, it's, uh, he's, this, you know, he's the founder of this of branch, which is in over 2 billion phones. And it's amazing. He's at the board meetings. It's an incredible. So for him, it was the right thing to do, right? But for some people, it might not be the right thing to do to quit when you're a freshman, right? I think it's so personal, that decision. Yeah. But ultimate, and a little bit, I mean, in terms of the educational question, yeah. there's probably just kind of like, what kind of person are you also? Yes. I mean, are you going to be happy with yourself as this MBA type of person and kind of imagine or you know, look at some role models and then look at some people who are, you know, PhDs in a, in a yeah. specific area, and like, am I like that person, or am I right? And there's no right path to be a founder. That is, you don't have to get a PhD to be a founder, or you don't have to get an MBA yeah. to be a founder. There are many routes to being a founder. 
but for your personal fulfillment, what do I want to do? That's the first question you should okay. ask. All right, so no pressure, but this will be the last question. Uh, okay, so uh, first of all, thank you guys for coming. Um, my question is uh, more directed towards uh, Patchman. Uh, you said that when you first came, you worked at a car wash and uh, afterwards went to selling rocks, right? So I know like as an immigrant myself, like coming to the United States is hard. Like, was there a point in your journey over here that you felt was very hard and you felt like going home? And at Sorry. that point, what was your motivation to keep on going? Like what drives you? What is your mindset? I didn't get the first part, sorry. Okay, uh, the, the first part was like, you said that you worked as a, a car wash uh, guy and selling rugs when you first came to the, the US, right? So like, I can imagine that would be pretty hard. So what was the turning point in your like adventure over here that made you like continue on and like grow to be where you are right now? By the way, I was the best car washer the world has ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you. Um, Everything I do, I try to be the best in the world. I think even when I sold carpets, I think I, at one, one year I sold $8 million worth of carpets. So that's, oh that's pretty. If you do it, do it well. Yeah. <laughs> so it remains to be seen if I'm a good venture capitalist or not. But I think if you do anything, if you just be the best in the world, I think you can, you can reach far. Um, you know, personally, I don't plan my life too much in advance. I just try to be take it day by day and do the best I can do it. And I think great things will happen. I think that's, I mean, some people really plan 10 years in advance. For me, it was very different. Um, I think the turning point when I came, I was in love with the girl in Iran, and I thought I'm going to lose her. So I, I actually came with $700 here. And I lost the whole thing in the first two weeks. Because in 1992, there was no internet phone, and it was pay phone. And I thought I'm going to lose her. So I called her every day, and I lost the whole thing. The first two weeks, that's why I got a job at the car wash. God, it's, I don't know how to close after that. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> oh my gosh. We actually celebrated our 23rd anniversary. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So I, with that, uh, I want to thank both of thank you, you for um, giving us this, I'm going to say, in-depth look at entrepreneurs and investors, that like we, we get this whole complete understanding of how you think and your, you know, and, and the whole background, everything. So thanks for sharing Thank all you. of this. Um, we really appreciate it. Thank you so okay. much. Thank it was you. an honor yeah. being here. Thank you. Thank you. All right.